Good day, everyone. This is uh, Chris with the Ancient Scholar, and uh, today what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be trying out a new uh, screen capture program, and hopefully things will go well, and these videos will go up on YouTube. This is going to be a, a video that I'm doing for the Respiratory Therapy Pharmacology course. Uh, I'm actually doing this in uh, toward the end of August of 2012, and in October of 2012, when they actually... Uh, have this lecture, uh, I uh, have to go to uh, New Orleans, to the uh, the National EMS Conference uh, there in New Orleans at the end of October, and I'll actually end up uh, missing this class. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be taking the PowerPoint and uh, doing screen capture, uh, recording over the presentation, and then hopefully uploading um, the, the series of lectures to YouTube for uh, the students to go over, and um, I'll probably just open this to the public as well, just so anybody can see these. So, uh, But uh, primarily what I'd like to do is, is to, to be able to present this lecture to my students, and uh, they can at least get this material. Um, and they're not missing out on, on the material, and I'm able to to discuss the uh, the critical concepts, the core concepts of this this lecture, um, because it is an important lecture, and certainly cardiovascular and clotting agents are commonly administered in the uh, both the pre-hospital and the hospital environment, and, and in all environments where the the respiratory therapist uh, may find him or herself working. Uh, so it's it's good to have at least a good familiarization with these agents, and of course, um, uh, let's see here. In about a year and a half, uh, those uh, those students that are in my class will actually be taking uh, pediatric advanced life support, advanced cardiac life support, and neonatal resuscitation, or the neonatal resuscitative program. Uh, and we'll be revisiting these agents in a bit more uh, detail or depth, if you will. Uh, but certainly this will provide a good gr good foundation and hopefully will help you out when you hit the clinical environment next semester uh, in your clinical rotations. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about today are um, cardiovascular and clotting agents, primarily for respiratory care. Uh, my name is Christopher Baer, and we'll go ahead and move on into uh, the lecture proper. I'll probably break this up into uh, several smaller lectures. It'll be easier to upload uh, the smaller uh, lectures um, onto YouTube. So this is going to be part one in a several-part series. So uh, moving on, I just want to go ahead and ensure that we are all okay on some basic cardiovascular, really uh, cardiac terminology in, in uh, regards to uh, many of the antidysrhythmic medications that I'll be talking about. So there's some terminology I want to cover, inotrope, chronotrope, automaticity, and drom dromotrope. So let's just start at the top of the list here um, for inotrope. So when I talk about inotrope or inotropy, what I'm really talking about is how well the heart is contracting, the strength or the force of contraction. If I say something is a positive inotropic drug or medication, um, that is a medication or a drug that enhances inotropy or increases contractility. If I say something has a negative inotropic effect, that decreases the contractility of the heart. Uh, chronotrope or chronotropic medications are medications that um, affect the rate, the heart rate. Chrono being uh, time, of course. Um, so a positive chronotrope is going to be a medication or a drug that's going to increase the heart rate. And a negative chronotrope is a drug that is going to decrease the heart rate. Now, there is a lot of crossover between all these terms. And there are certain medications that may be um, enhance one term and decrease another. And a good example would be a medication known as dig digoxin or linoxin. It's used to treat um, heart failure and a certain cardiac dysrhythmias such as atrial fibrillation. And uh, this medication, digoxin, is a positive inotropic medication, okay, so it enhances contractility, but it is a negative chronotrope, okay? So it, it increases contractility and decreases heart rate. 
and of course that is a desirable effect for somebody, it would say somebody is in atrial fibrillation, where um, they've lost, their, their atria are fibrillating, so they've lost their uh, a good amount of preload, the atrial kick, um, so they do need something to enhance the contractility of the heart, but oftentimes in atrial fibrillation, they can uh, develop rates that are too quick if all of those atrial impulses are, are making it into the ventricles, and of course that's called atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. So a medication like um, digoxin may affect uh, more than one of these, these concepts at the same time, so these are certainly not isolated concepts. Okay, moving on to automaticity. Automaticity has to do with the pacemaker cells of the heart, and really what it has to do is uh, with uh, cells can um, basically take over as a pacemaker of the heart. And um, some cells uh, may be able to um, depolarize faster than other cells, for example. Uh, the cells within the uh, SA or the sinoatrial node of the heart are going to be faster, are going to have an intrinsic rate, um, their automatic rate, okay, their set rate uh, are, will be faster than, say, a cell in the, uh, the ventricle where it is going to have much slower rate. Um, and uh, just to kind of give you an example, think of uh, a heart, maybe somebody's had a heart transplant, well, if they've had a heart transplant, uh, the new heart that is put in, of course, is not connected to that patient's nervous system. And, of course, the nervous system acts upon the heart to, to um, make it beat harder, faster, or um, slower with less force. And um, when you have a heart transplant, you disconnect. The heart is disconnected from the nervous system and it'll always be that way, but somehow the heart, even though it's disconnected from the nervous system, the heart will continue beating and that is due to the automaticity. Okay, The cells in the SA node are able to take over as a pacemaker. Well, certain medications can make those pacemaker cells um, fire faster and certain medications can blunt the automaticity of the heart or those cells. Now, in some cases, we may want to enhance automaticity. In other cases, such as uh, some of the, the ventricular dysrhythmias that we run into, uh, we don't want those cells in the ventricles taking over as pacemaker and causing problems. Um, and we may want to decrease automaticity of the cells. It just kind of depends on uh, what's going on. And then the last term is something called dromotrope. Um, and dromotrope refers to the speed of conduction or the velocity, um, how quickly an impulse is conducted through the heart. Um, a positive dromotrope will enhance conductivity or conduction through the heart, whereas a negative dromotrope will decrease the speed of conduction. And of course, there are some cases where I'd want to increase, in some cases, where I want to decrease. Okay, so that's our basic terminology. Okay, so let's just move into uh, looking at cardiac conduction and looking at the EKG. So here I just have a basic EKG rhythm. This is a normal rhythm or a normal patient. Um, the first little um, upward deflection I see here is known as the P wave. Okay, and um, you, of course, have learned this already in anatomy and physiology, but I'm just going to review it real quick, make sure everybody's on the same page. And the P wave, if you, you follow this little arrow up to the heart, the P wave is associated with the SA node, which is the prime, and under normal circumstances, is the primary pacemaker of the heart. Um, the SA node fires, you see the P wave. And the wave of depolarization moves through the intranodal pathways throughout the atria of the heart. And that is represented by the P wave and the P to R interval. Now, after the P wave down here, we see the, kind of this little pause here. And what that little pause is, is the impulse is held briefly here at the AV node. Well, what does that do? Well, the atria have to finish contracting, right? Because the atria pump blood down into the ventricles. So the AV node stalls that impulse 
um, slightly for a, a very very short amount of time and allows the atria to, to fill the ventricles, to preload the ventricles, and then the impulse travels um, through the AV node down the, the uh, right and left bundle branches and out to the distal hispurkinji fibers and the ventricles contract and that's what we see here with the QRS is depolarization of the ventricles and hopefully contraction. Um, I should say that um, this, the EKG or ECG is just a measure of the electrical activity, the depolarization, repolarization of the heart, and it doesn't necessarily mean the heart is beating, okay? Um, you can have electrical activity in the heart, but you can have a heart that is not beating, and of course that is something known as PEA, or pulseless electrical activity, uh, which is generally a very, very serious uh, rhythm that indicates a patient that's uh, profoundly morbid. And then, Following the QRS, I have the T wave here, and the T wave represents repolarization of the ventricles um, as they reset themselves, in essence, and get ready for the next wave of polarization. The atria, of course, repolarize, but atrial repolarization happens during the QRS. You don't actually see it because the QRS complex drowns that out. Okay, so that's just a basic look at the ECG and the basic cardiac conduction, just a review of what you've had in anatomy and physiology. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to talk about the action potential. And I want to look at the action potential in a little different light. So if you see down here, I have an ECG, okay? I have uh, my QRS complex and my T wave. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to look at what's happening to the different um, electrolytes um, in the QRS complex. And it's typically when you uh, talk about anatomy and physiology, you have a picture that looks like this here. And often what I find is that, that uh, people don't necessarily explain this picture very well, but it is actually very helpful and it helps us understand certain cardiac medications if we know what's going on in this picture here. Okay, so what I have here is I'm actually looking, if you look on the, um, the y-axis here, okay, this is um, looking at the potential, the electrical potential, um, across the membrane of the myocardial cell right here. The x-axis here represents time. Okay, so we're going to look at the PQRST complex, um, and we're going to look at it now not um, on what we'd see on EKG, but what actually is going on with the electrolytes and the electrical potential across the, the membrane of the cell. When the cell is at, quote unquote at rest, it is not depolarizing, I am in what's called phase four, and this is this flat line here. And the potential across the membrane of the cell is about negative 90 to negative 100 millivolts, okay? So there is a negative potential across the cell. And uh, typically I have um, a significant amount of potassium within the cell and a significant amount of sodium outside of the cell, okay, in the resting potential. Um, of course, I have um, some large negatively charged proteins within the cell that don't move. Um, they stay there the whole time. Um, so really, the, the three electrolytes that do move are uh, sodium, uh, potassium, and calcium. Okay. So what happens is the cell is stimulated and depolarization begins. This, this potential moves up this way. Um, it becomes less negative. Um, and I think right about negative 70 or so is the threshold. And once, of course, if you remember from anatomy physiology and neurology, neurology and cardiology in your AMP classes, once you hit the threshold potential, you have depolarization. Um, so what happens is we move from phase four into this straight line here, which is phase zero. During the straight line, what I have is I have a very quick um, influx of sodium into the cell, okay? So I have a rapid, or my fast-moving sodium, or what we call my fa fast sodium channels open up. Sodium rushes into the cell, potassium rushes out. I have massive amount of sodium coming in, um, sodium being positively charged, 
is going to take the negative potential and push it towards positive, and that's going to have happen very rapidly. Okay, so I move from phase four into phase zero, which is rapid depolarization, and then I have phase one um, and phase two, where I kind of have a plateau. And right here in phase two, um, so phase zero and one are more my sodium channels. And then phase two, actually what I have is I have calcium um, rushing into the cell through the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum, if you remember from anatomy physiology. And of course, calcium is actually what opens the um, cross bridges um, on the actin myosin, uh, the tropomyosin troponin binding sites. And that it actually is where I have contraction occurring in phase two. And then during phase three, I have my repolarization, where potassium is pumped, um, actively pumped through the sodium potassium ATPase pump back into the cell, uh, or potassium is pumped into the cell, sodium is pumped out, and of course I have, um, I'm now reestablishing the resting potential, right? Sodium's leaving, so the charge, the, the, um, uh, the electrical potentials become more negative until the cell gets back to uh, phase four or the resting potential. Okay, so that is the um, the basic understanding of the uh, cardiac action potential. And that will go ahead and bring this part of the presentation to a conclusion and basically just reviewing some of the basic concepts and building ourselves up toward talking about the pharmacology proper. Um, I really wanted to spend a little time on the uh, introductory stuff simply because if you can understand what's going on during the action potential, where sodium potassium are moving, it will make it much easier to understand how um, the antidysrhythmic medications are working because we have a classification system that I'll talk about in the next video called the Von Williams classification where we classify cardiac medications um, by what electrolyte um, or what, what type of channel um, they work on, um, be it sodium, uh, a fast sodium, an intermediate or a slow sodium channel, um, be it a potassium channel, calcium channel, and even um, uh, beta receptors and so on. Um, and I'll discuss those concepts in the next video. Okay, guys, um, as always, thanks for hanging in there.